cannot have in success, where they're getting their inspiration from because that's what drives you in direction. And where do they want to go? What do they believe the future to be? These are the things that you have to have in like normal discussion. And most of the time when people interview people in, in reading or, or cultivation, it's, 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 it's uh, here's a question. But what you want to be able to do is have a story. You want to be able to have the people kind of catch you into it because you're going to find the parallels that you're going to go through also. And in the process of it, it brings out questions. And then you're able to say, hey, I got a question. I want to ask a question. And all you got to do is raise your hand. We'll pause it up. And a lot of times, with a lot of people I've worked with over the past, people are terrified to be up here. So I kind of coach them through it to help them. If they, if they falter and, and get nervous, I say, give me the mic and I'll, I'll, I'll talk some shit for a minute. And then you'll be all right. But as we go forward, it seems like our population of people are really coming, coming about it in a lot better way where they feel more normal and they feel more trust in around the people they're with. And so what we're going to do is I'm just going to give the mic. We're going to let everybody introduce themselves. And they're going to give you uh, uh, just a brief couple minutes of, you know, this is who I am, this is where I'm from, this is what I'm doing. We'll go through the group so this way you can identify who they are. And then we're going to ask some questions. We're going to go through a series of questions. And they're loose. And if anybody has a question they want to ask anybody specifically, if there's something that you want to have a, a, a deeper dive into, feel free. Because what it's doing is it's, it's, it's letting you see the participants in the industry in an intimate manner, in a way that you need to see, so that you start to be able to figure out how do you present yourself and how do you create the picture you need to create so that the buying public can see you, how do you create the picture so that the regulatory public can see you. And then what you start to have is, 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 a, is a real forward movement. We were, we were hiding for so long that we have to come forward and the only way to do it is together. And so that's what this is all about. So not an expose. I'm not here to bust anybody's balls. And I hope that you enjoy what we're about to throw down. All right? Yeah. Hell yeah. Woo! Awesome. Uh, well, first off, I'm Sam Cody from the Woodstock Pharmacy. And this is Angela Bailey, my wife. <laughs> now, uh, we're breeders at heart. Where's Woodstock? Yeah, yeah. Woodstock is uh, on Route 26, about 25 minutes south of Sunday River in the mountains, western Maine. Nice. You know, about the green belt of Maine, consider it. <laughs> um, on our farm, we got 48 acres. We try to do the regenerative farming as much as we can. We enjoy creating life on our farm. Um, I started breeding basically because my old man had a tropical fish room in the basement when I was a kid. He had about 250 fish tanks down there, so I spent most of my time picking eggs out of the peat moss and yarn when I was a kid. So I got the breeding bug. As I grew older, I, you know, we started to like different things. So I started smoking cannabis and growing cannabis because I knew once I started smoking, I said, hey, I can create this myself. Why keep buying it off other people? And then uh, I was like, hey, I'm just gonna make my own strains. So I started making my own strains when I was about 19, 20 years old. Met my lady here. We, uh, we moved to Maine when I was 22 and the cops actually raided us. Took everything from us. Uh, tried to take our kids from us and everything, but uh, everything worked out in the end. We held strong and we've been coming back for the past 10 years. I've been making my own genetics again, and everything's been going really well. And I'm excited to uh, show everybody what I got out there. And yeah, it's scary for me to be up here. <laughs> <laughs> I got some serious PTSD, guys, but I'm trying to deal with it these days. So that's who I am, and that's why I like to breed cannabis, basically. Thank you for your service. Thanks. Thank you. So my name is Chadwick Rhodes. Um, I've been a cannabis cultivator for, I think I planted my first plant in 94 uh, in Indiana. I grew uh, bubble gum in 96 in Indiana and uh, I kind of got away from it uh, until about 2000. And I moved up here in Maine and uh, connected with a lot of uh, outdoor guys, big, big time outdoor guys, and uh, they were struggling. Most of them were growing leaves and and uh, they just couldn't figure out why they couldn't finish their, their plants in Maine. And uh, I'm like, oh, I got you. And uh, so I started cloning for these guys. And my uh, passion early on was, was really with breeding and the compassionate side of cannabis anyway. 
i myself it's helped me a lot with p t s d and back problems and i've seen it do remarkable things with other people so needless to say i started supplying clones to a lot of the larger gorilla growers growers in the state mostly north of bangor so guys up in the county guys growing near katahdin guys doing you know anywhere from a hundred to three or four thousand plants and for me i'm a i'm a master carpenter at heart i've always been in the construction trades and that translated very well to cannabis whenever the move came to indoor because i was the guy that you know not only did i have genetics but i had to know how to get you inside or to or to get your ear off a little more clandestine these guys were growing in grid patterns outdoors and I'm like, uh, let me show you a satellite image of your grow. <laughs> and uh, they're like, oh, that's that's our last year's grow. I'm like, yeah, they update every six months. <laughs> so I, you know, that's, uh, I, I spent a lot of time collecting genetic material over the years. Uh, I got a hold of, um, I actually, when the, when the gray market hit, a lot of the OGs got out. I, I don't even, maybe one or two guys that I know, and I used to know hundreds that were that were in the business, they're all gone. Um, and I decided to get out myself, but uh, four or five years ago, I thought, geez, man, this cannabis thing is coming to the East Coast, and I should double down, and I should keep my library. And uh, so I went to the University of Maine and enrolled in their environmental horticulture program and knocked down a bucket list, and as of December, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in environmental horticulture, and that was quite a commitment for me. Uh, I realized that I wasn't as smart as I, was, I thought I was whenever it came to uh, plants and soil science and, and all of that, and, I, and I'm super glad that I did it, and uh, uh, the difference for me is I'm, I'm not a seed company. So I'm not a breeder that sells seeds. I'm the guy that everybody used to come to for clones. But what I am is I do curate and I, I hold genetics like Kev does for people. And I'm the guy that uh, people have trusted and now they're starting to come back to me. You know, do you still have Sour Sue? Do you still have Kim Ford? Do you still have, and so, some of them I don't, you know, some of them I do. And uh, uh, me personally, uh, I like to collaborate with people on breeding. I breed for many different reasons. And then personally, I'm taking my uh, my know-how, my ingenuity, and I'm injecting myself into the Massachusetts market. Under uh, I'm going to be helping manage a company called 1620 Labs. Uh, they got their cultivation license there, and and we're we're in the the beginning stages. Uh, I'm glad to be here, and thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for coming out. It's a great event. Uh, my name is Jason DePerio. I'm originally from Cape Nick, Maine, which is about 45 minutes south of here. And unlike my partner, not my partner, but my colleague here, I started with a landscape horticulture education and then I dropped out like the last semester and went into cannabis. So I went the opposite route, but I definitely got a good background on certain landscape horticulture stuff. And all that time, I was also growing cannabis. But I cut my teeth <coughs> with uh, Gorilla Growing probably 2002, something like that. Ordered a bunch of seeds online, loaded up my backpack with soil, head to the swamp, and that's where I started all my breeding, basically. Right when I started, I started breeding, just because I didn't want to keep buying seeds from different companies. So I found what worked for me, and I used that stuff. And Right now, I've been on the same farm in North Berwick, which is 45 minutes south of more west inland. And I've been there doing full-term outdoor, light deprivation, and breeding this whole time just for fungal resistance mainly, and then different terpene profiles, basically what my patients need, basically what they want. So I personally don't like cookies, crosses, or anything like that, but one of my patients, that's all he wants are cookie crosses, so I gotta go that route. So I'm trying to find cookie crosses that are gonna finish earlier and outside and all that stuff. So I'm just playing around with different genetics and just going regenerative route and that's basically my background. Yeah, 
video you said uh, they try to snatch your kid. They try to take my kid too. And it, it creates a resentment to the system that's profound and it's hard to let it go. Yeah, it's hard to let it go because you they would they they would yeah no no you 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 have a a, a a very emotional attachment to your family when they're trying to peel it apart over some weed you just like you you get hateful, but bottom line is you know we're thankfully we're in a better situation now the way you can move forward and it's a process but I feel you I understand that one. The question is you know for you guys that are on the East Coast uh, doing what you're doing. Uh, a lot of my interest in people is like, what would you start off with genetically? You know, what was the stuff you worked with? And I'm going to pass the mic around, but like, you know, for me, when we started growing in Rhode Island, I did, I think the first outdoor was like 81. And it was uh, seed we were peeling out of the, out of the bales. And like my grandmother had a garden and she was old at the time, so she wasn't out there tending it. But we knew the soil was rich. So we went and packed it up with some weed. We grew our first crop. And then the next year, I grew a whole a whole backyard full of Colombian, and I got nailed by the police, and I got dragged off to the training school. But my, my original cannabis varieties, you know, was, was stuff that was sifted from bale form. And when I took off from New England in 84, you know, I lost track of what people were doing here. And so I'm always curious, you know, when you guys got into growing at your time, you know, what was the varieties that were present? What did you get into? And was there people around you at the time that were, you know, doing similar work? Do you have friends that were involved? You know, like, basically your, your genetic history, you know? And that's the kind of the question we're going to go here. Because that's really the root of where you began, and it's the root of where we're at right now. Because the material that you guys work with is what everybody or many had access to. And that kind of it reflects your genetic population now. And before I forget, Rebel does nice work on the cookies. So I went out and checked out, you know, quarter acre of cookie alone. And it was all the seed lines and he's working for uh, higher fungal resistance and quicker flower time and a better visual appearance. Because cookie, for people who like that earthy cookie dough tone, they do. And you can't deny that a cherry pie cushion is in a bad genetic package. And, and he's marketed the living shit out of it. So it, it has a sellability that's unreal. But for some people, it really is killer cannabis. It's just trying to bring that cookie down from us, which is basically November 1st finish, to get it down into that first week of October or so. And uh, that's what Don's Rebel's been working on for a while. There's you know, a lot of cookie hybrids that are killer. So just keep that in mind. And you could hit him up and ask him, hey, which one of your versions of cookie you know, would I work with if I wanted to trigger? And for a lot of people that are involved in, in these seasons here, you just got to take your plants and put them into some kind of uh, situation where you can hit your light trigger. So if you know you want, you want to finish it at a certain time, you're going to know the light cycle of that time, and then you have to figure out what's the initiation light cycle that makes that plant want to flower. And that's going to give you your true flowering period here. And if you don't do that R&D first, then you're going to find yourself putting a lot of plant material out that will not finish. And so you're going to do pre-testing on it to find out when does it initiate, because if it has a 60-day finish but it doesn't start flowering until September, you're screwed. Because it's going to take you too deep. And so the, the point is with a lot of these modern varieties that have been developed in full sun climates, they've been developed in dry climates, they've been developed in places where you have every, every ability to succeed, you as northern growers just really have to take them and then do some sifting and figure out how do you take that plant and either use it as it is or how do you take that plant and take the qualities from it and put it on to what you're using here. So this way you're not forced to miss the trends. You're not forced to miss some of these things that people are going after, because the bottom line is that's 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 business. So, what's uh, what started you off? So the strains I started off with were a Hawaiian sativa. My mentor gave me this. Uh, I started growing cannabis when I was 17, like I said. Uh, he approached me. He asked me if I wanted to do a wood floor in his house. So I went and did a wood floor in his house. Cause you know I was smoking a joint with him. He disappears. He comes back up. Hey, you want to come down the base with me? Check this out. I went down there. He had some pot plants going on down there. I was like, sweet, cool. He said, you want to help me trim this? I was like, great, I'll help you trim that. <laughs> so he tells me the story of where he gets his stuff. Apparently, someone's brother gave him the Hawaiian sativa. He crossed that Hawaiian sativa immediately. He got it in bud form with seeds. So we started off with the Hawaiian sativa. Uh -uh. Then we ordered LA Confidential and The Hog from Amsterdam a few years later. I took The Hog, put that into the Hawaiian, and also put that into the LA Confidential. 
I worked those trains outdoors for uh, probably two, three years, and then they were taken from me. So I had to restart everything over. Would but you, I did, Would you go with on the next run? On the next run, um, my mentor gave me the LA Confidential Cutback. Now it's pretty old at this point, you know what I mean? So I was like, all right, I gotta revive this thing with something. So I went to Exotic Genetics page and found the Kimbo Kush. Bought three packs of Kimbo Kush, found the strongest, most vigorous male that did the best outside, covered in hash, you know what I mean? Hit that to the LA Confidential, and then um, took that male and found another local bred strain from my friend who had been growing in the mountains, which was an old school NL5 Durban poison. So I had an old strain from Maine and my old strain that me and my mentor had been doing, and I put those two together. And that's the Galaxial Stardust. So that's kind of what started me off right now. I hold that right now and I'm still working it. And um, I'm working another BX at the LA Con right now called the Kokoro. Um, and that's about it for my outdoor strains right now. And I'm working some MLB into the line, but. Is your mentor still around? Oh yeah, my mentor is still around and he's still in the shadows. Nice. You know what I mean? He, I don't think he's ever gonna come out. <laughs> you know, he's old school, so. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to see it too. I'm not so sure I might not have been a part of it if it came from Maine. Yeah, it's yeah. really old and it's really, it smells like a can of red on a warm summer day. Yeah, and I'll find it. Yeah, it's kind of Only in cannabis. Yeah, yeah. 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 sorry. It smells like a wet diaper. Yeah. yeah. It's something you don't smoke all the time. You only smoke it when you can handle smoking it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's gas. It's real gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's putrid. When I came to Maine, um, I, I got a hold of Durban Poison uh, right away. The guys that were growing up north had it, and uh, they couldn't finish it. And we ran NL5 into it, and um, and we and we it was still second or third week of October, which was a struggle for people up in the county, uh, uh, pretty far north. If you don't get it done in September, you're not going to finish it north of Katahdin. It's really it's really tough to do up there. Um, that's that's one of the things that we worked with early. But uh, I would say right around 2004 or five, uh, the diesels hit hard, and and I mean, uh, it, it came to the point where everything that we were sending to Boston or New York was a diesel, or you were calling it a diesel. Um, <laughs> me personally, uh, I got a hold of a sour suit cut that. Uh, there was there was four phenos and you can confirm most of this maybe uh, out of the four phenos one didn't have any CBD and I ended up with that one had about 18 percent THC when they tested it liquid chromatography but uh, I crossed that with my uh, prize Afghan mail and uh, we we sent it out as New York City diesel for years just kept telling people oh yeah it's diesel it's diesel and uh, and so we ran diesel hard. Um, uh, personally, I like to breed for other reasons, though. I hold uh, a lot of land race stuff, like uh, from India, and um, I'm a believer that we're not so sure that it maybe started in Nepal. It might be. Uh, it might have started in the Congo. If you look at uh, biological diversity in the world, the most diverse place in the world is the Congo. Our problem is we can't get there because they want to kill us, um, and we can't uh, really check it out. The only thing we really see to come from that region is Durban. I do love it, and I've lost it since, so you're my new friend. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, the diesels were hard. Uh, me personally, I'm, I'm a little bit more, uh, I like the, the chocolate, so I started working Ken Dog 4 into some stuff, and um, yeah, early on, that was, that was, those were the staples. The perks came along, and uh, wasn't impressed. I, I, I loved the way it looked, liked how big it was, but uh, the, 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 for me, the taste, the flavor, and all that was just about half there, but it moved like hotcakes. And uh, that, that I would say that that trend in Maine only lasted a couple of years, really. Um, yeah, that's where I started at. Uh, now I'm working on a lot of other stuff. Uh, first plant again, Durban Poison, that was the first clone I got from 
my buddy up in Orono. He was doing huge row grows, like before I was really into it. He calls me up, like the guy I used to get my herb from, you know. He calls me up, he's like, oh, I got some work for you. I go down there and it's a room just full of herb. Most herb I've ever seen hanging. And I'm like, holy crap. Just <laughs> trimming big, huge cola buds. It's like, wow, this is crazy. This is awesome, you know. So that's really what got me into gorilla growing outside and stuff like that. But the Durban poison was probably the same. It was up Bangor, so it's probably the same lineage around there. September 15th. Yeah. 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 Nice. Just this. Nice. Yeah. Nice. But uh, so I got a bunch of clones, and that was the first strain that I actually put outside and grew. Was that Durban poison? So that's a common link. Mm -hmm. But uh, seeds that I ordered that I started with was a. Uh, Afghani skunk from Canada, which was super skunky. They called it BC Roadkill. And I can't remember the, it was a small Canadian company. He's no longer around. I can't really remember the name of the company. And then I also ordered the church from Greenhouse back in the day. And that actually did really good it's outside. It's not a burning church, right? No, it didn't. It was, the one that I had some, had some tropical coconut tones, but it had some, it had some good mold resistance. Like you put it outside, it wasn't super, didn't have super thick buds or anything, but it was nice. It was a nice smoke. And those were the first two plants that I really started breeding with was the, the BC Roadkill and the Church, just because those are the varieties I had. Those are the varieties that I got. And then after that, my buddy who I grew with, he was big into construction. And we would go out and do a couple of growth spots, you know, just small scale stuff compared to nowadays. But uh, he knew a cloner, an older guy. He was like 50 at the time. The guy's guy's probably like 70 or 80 now. But he had an Ortega, uh, blueberry, one of the main blueberries, uh, and cherry slider. So we got those clones and then we worked with those. And the blueberry I still use in a lot of stuff. And the Ortega I actually got back and I pollinated that up. So the blueberry lends a lot of mold resistance to things. The, the female that I grew was in, at my dad's house actually probably <coughs> six years ago. It was super huge buds, just done super early, not a speck of mold on it. So I was like, all right, that's gonna be the basis of a lot of my breeding. So I interlaid that blueberry into a lot of different things and really boosted mold resistance, early finishing, yield, everything. So it was really great. So that was basically the basis where I started. And now I have just tons of different strains that I'm working with, and I'm always going towards mold resistance, early finishing, different stuff like that. That's because I'm going towards outdoor, and I need I need those things to finish outside with no mold issues. So you need you need to get it in October first week of October, absolutely latest. So we try to get everything done by then at the absolute latest, and then I'll work with different strains to try to. I'm a one man op, so. I don't want everything coming in at one time. Otherwise, I got 30 big plants I'm dealing with. So I don't want to scatter them out a little bit. So I want, you know, end of August, I got something that's coming in. Beginning of September, I got something that's coming in and it's professional, so it's staggered, you know. So that's basically the basis of my breeding. I'm gonna start getting some CBD stuff this year. And mainly I just breed for my own purposes. I'm not like a seed bank or anything like that. I do start like seed lanes and give them out to people and sell them, but I'm just giving my seeds out for people to try. And I did a freeze limb this year and that one finished August 22nd for the first cut. And then I did another cut August 28th. I like the August 22nd cut better. Yeah, I thought it maybe went a little bit too long at August 28th, which seems a little crazy, yeah. But, uh, but so then I pollinated that with some Royal Pollen, crossed with a GG4, and then some Royal Cross with an MOB. So I'm gonna try those this year to see if I can change up the turps a little bit and still get that early, early finish time on it. So that's basically what I'm working on. Cool. I had to get your number, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's funny about the, see, I used to, I, 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 to me, Africa is uh, like the birthplace of humanity. And I always believed that cannabis was, it was so widespread, but I said, is it possible that it had multiple sources of creation? And it's just that when you talk to people that are mapping the genome, they're seeing relationship traits that kind of help you understand that maybe it, maybe it was a common spot. And then as we dragged it through the world, and I think predominantly it was dragged so much by uh, slaves where it was part of your religion and, it was, and as you were moved and, and shuffled throughout the earth, to me, it was always blue-collar people, people who didn't work with smoke cannabis. 
and they moved this product to every inch of the globe to where they were going to have their their new world. And they, I think, a lot of them risk death to do it because it's a, a, a drug that creates independence from other people. So it was always feared. But it's so it's, it's hell interesting to see where it comes from because I like African varieties too. I just got a hold of a Roberts Congo, and it was pretty nice. Right, and the, and the Congolese is it's it doesn't have hydropinaline, so it's not like a train wreck or a, or a, or a haze. It doesn't have the frankincense smell. It's it's got this it's just spicy. But it had such an electric high that I, I smoked it in Canada. And I swear to God, I wanted to get out of the car and run alongside the damn thing. And I was just like, car ain't going fast enough. Let me just run alongside and I'll jump back in. And I said, man, that is some really good grass. I haven't had anything that like, put a foot in my ass like that in a minute. And I said, that is some really nice pot. And then I ended up getting the plant. And so you know, it lets, it lets you have some of these killer characteristics. And it's a hybrid, so it had, you know, better bud morphology so that it's visually attractive to people. Otherwise, it's hard to convince them. People are so picky now visually. But that, that Congolese is just nasty. Um, when you guys started off with what you were doing in cultivation practice, I know that you're in regen, I know you do hugo culture. Um, like for me, when we first started in New England, it was just in the soil, in the, in the, in the ground that your grandmother had built. Then when I go into the yard later on, it's in piles of lung. So we had all this killer material we had in the backyard, and I just raked it all out and grew right into it. But when I got into cannabis cultivation in the Bay Area, that was when the indoor revolution was taking place, and that's when Stonewall really came out. And I went into Rockwall, and I was punching out Rockwall operation. And I thought I was just killing it until I met this cat named Ralph who was doing outdoor in the Bay Area. And I was just like, holy shit, it's such a better product. And it's just incredible in terms of the complexity of the smoke. And so the Rockwell gave us visual, and it gave us production numbers, and it gave us all the things that sold cannabis. But it was my first introduction to the difference between biopot and and what we would call chempot. And the difference was dramatic. Now you you had a background in, in fish tank work. Did you go right into organic development? Did you did you um, begin that route? I started off organic. Nice, nice. I did play around with the uh, hydroponics and fish a little bit, but I found the bacteria was so alive in the fish water that every time I fed it, it just simply ate through the soil. So I never really dialed that in much. I want to get back into that a little bit more, but. Steve, you have Steve. Uh, no. Oh, Steve from Brad, but the, uh, uh, Steve, what about your mind? He's a alcoholic specialist. Nice, yeah, yeah. nice. He's a visual, I'll give you some movie before you take off. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, he does, the, the, the way he uses the tool is incredible because you can use the aquaculture component for vegetative speed, yep. and then you can use it to be able to get a much higher uh, microbial level, period, and then you can either finish it that way or you can just take those plants and ship it. Gotcha. But, but listen to him talk about it. Absolutely. He's fire. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I started off with bad guanos and building organic soil, basically. I know we were all trying to remove ourselves from the back funnels and everything these days, but you know, back 12, 13 years ago, what we had access to, you know what I mean? So, yeah, basically building organic soils and guano teas. You know, I had buckets with the stockings in my attic hanging, sticking out my whole house, you know? So, yeah, we started off like that, and a um, year after that, I delved into hydroponics a little bit, but you know, that's not where my passion is, so. Um, outdoor, we do everything regeneratively, organically, but inside, in the winter, we do use uh, synthetic nutrients with an organic soil. It's just a little bit easier right now, and a little, more, uh, a little smoother. But eventually, we will be all regenerative indoors as well, we want to be at that point. So. <coughs> I'd love to be using all my soil from outside and bring it inside, but I need a building for all that and more space. So, you know, you work your way up to that point, you know. So, yeah, basically started off organically, and it's really how I love to grow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Explain myself better. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's your background? Um, everything I, I know, I've learned from him. He's honestly brilliant. He's a master. He's stuck in my own mind. He's stuck in his own mind. He can't get it out really well. And I'm starting to be like him because he's talking.
taught me how to be such a hard worker and I'm just trying to like learn from her too. But um, yeah, uh, we actually, our farm that we live on, when we bought it, it, it contains, what do they say? Soil, soil of statewide importance. Yeah. It's like really good soil. So downside is we were actually lied to. We had 12 total acres and uh, a lot of that topsoil was removed from Cold Stock property. So it's now our job to build it all back up. And yeah, I'm kind of a leader and kind of like a leader, say, you know. Um, but we mainly use, uh, we started off our soil with a local guy who makes living acres. Like, living acres. Conversation amongst ourselves over here. <laughs> Usually we got two mics and it's easier, you know. And this this one we're just chopping it up. Then we were saying I was you was talking about his inputs, and I was saying, are you able to gather the inputs locally because it saves you a lot of money? And what it does is it closes the loop and it allows you to be able to meet the people that are doing the inputs and so that you're able to find out are they really the quality you need and they're gonna come with any kind of contaminants that are gonna screw you up. So if you if, Nowadays, it's, in California, the testing is so unbelievably rigorous. It's the single most heavily, agri heavily regulated agricultural crop in human history. And so California has a level of scrutiny that is mind-bending. And you have to really go do tests of all your inputs before you use it so that you find out there's no contaminants in the input. And I mean, it's a freaking nightmare. That's why, you know, being able to source locally is killer like that. And I was just saying, back in the day, I had a lot of old friends that they, um, they did all their own kelp harvests you know, off the beach. So they would pull all the kelp in, soak it down, wash it, get the salts off, and then break it down. What you got? Yeah, I was going to actually comment on that. The Living Acres, that guy makes one of the most amazing complimented yeah. seaweed extracts. That's from, what I wanted from to say next. And for organic growers up in the main coast and in that area, it's such a compliment to taking something from the or area and the microorganisms in the, in the, and from the water, the, the mm -hmm. point of the beginning, mm -hmm. and Everything's introducing local. it to our soils. It's just, it's just adding a happiness to it and an already evolving have you tried this new oat mix? No, I haven't. It's amazing for seed starting. Awesome. I, think I like seeing the test. Check that out. That's, that's the whole point of doing your IMO, yeah, yeah. where you're doing indig indigenous microorganism. I learned, I learned that off of YouTube a long time ago watching the Filipino people. So Filipino people were doing their own culture, and they were keeping their culture like, like sourdough star, like red star. And they had held it for a hundred years. They literally were keeping the ball of this stuff and they were moving it through time. And I realized, I said, whoa, I got you. They're gathering indigenous microorganisms from the area around where they were cultivating their vegetable crops and they were using it to do inoculations. And so we started gathering leaf litter from the local area and I had buddies that had bamboo growing and we were able to mine microbes from the bamboo patches. And then we were able to start brewing them up and applying them so we could start utilizing it. And I was trying to figure out how I too could have a ball of IMO starter so I could hold it in my hand. And my buddies were laughing because they're like, what are you doing? But I was caught up in it because I just realized, I said, man, the things that you're picking up locally are going to be adapted to the local situation and they're going to work better. And so much of the, the material you purchase is from so far away from where you're at that it doesn't really give the benefit. It's just a nutrient. Doesn't have the living factor, and so if you guys be able to mine your coast like that heavy, yeah. you know it's fascinating. How far are you off the water? Like, what's your what's your claim? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So you're not facing it. You're not facing the coastal influence. Uh, yeah, I started um, in Indiana in the cornfields. We'd have to uh, we'd have to wait for the anhydrous ammonia to be sprayed, and, and uh, so we were convinced.
intentionally farming off their packs, piggybacking. Uh, you were in trouble if your plants got taller than the corn <laughs> too quick. And uh, after that, I moved to um, I, I moved to Maine, and, and these guys were were basically uh, throwing you know bales of promix down and uh, and blue water all day. And uh, and in the winter time, they were running clay pellets or or rock wool and and PVC pipes and ebb and flow. Um, and, and, and it was it was conventional all the way. I couldn't convince these guys. I'm like, uh, you're buying your ProMix for $24 a bale. You can go buy peat moss for 10. You buy perlite and then throw compost in and, and go there. You know, watering with blue stuff. And, and and I was surprised. I got a lot of guys to switch to, to get to get away from the salts as, as much as possible. But uh, heavily heavily that stuff was was grown like that up until about. 2010 up here and uh, personally I moved away from it um, as quickly as possible um, I, I still I can clone in water you know and uh, I, I just I limited clonex if I if you know if I'm not in a super hurry um, but for me the it all begins with a soil test uh, the University of Maine you know 17 bucks uh, you can find out exactly what you have and you can also get a, a bio count you know, parts per million, see how active your soil really is. And you can also do this on container mixes. And and they'll give you they'll give you the information. I'm not sure why I can't convince people to do it. I tell people all the time, they, you know, October, I've got a problem. I'm like, oh, did you do a soil sample? No, I told you to do it. It's just, uh, it's crazy to me that people don't do that. Now I have, because uh, uh, I'm holding a large library, I must have eight, 10 males. And, you know, 20 or 30 females right now, and and uh, so I do have some lights, and um, <clears throat> but I'm bio in the containers, and I'm holding my nematodes in water culture, and I've got a microscope, and once a week I'm taking samples of of, of that uh, inoculant, checking it, and you know, so I'm maintaining that bio culture in the container. You can do all the regenerative things that you've talked about here in a container. You've just got to understand, you know, how they interact, you know, how you're creating that little tiny ecosystem and what's, you know, might or might not be missing from it. Hey, what size container are you running? Uh, I, personally, I, I run, you know, I'm either in four inch pots on small stuff that I'm running quick, uh, going up to sixes and then uh, I'm in five gallons with my mother's. Uh, in a five gallon pot, I'm, you know, I'm holding them on maybe you know, eight months tops. I really don't, you know, I usually cycle them through pretty quick. Uh, you know, uh, you get a buildup of, uh, um, you, you can tend to get acidic in your containers and that's a lot of things, you know, people don't realize that over time that'll happen. So you gotta be checking your pH. Uh, for me personally, it's, it's great to get outdoors. So just as soon as I can get all my plants outdoors, the lights are off and, you know, and I'm getting that uh, full spectrum sun to, to regenerate them and I'll even take moms and throw them in the ground uh, you know unrestricted root development is where it's at for size uh, you know you get into a real good living soil and you've got you know the best clones you could ask for so I started my work career as a landscaper gardener lawnmower for one of the largest companies down south in the town that I grew up in and going around these properties, you see all these little white signs, stay off the lawn for a certain amount of time, pesticide application. You see all these signs, it's like, why not stay off that stuff? So this mindset came onto me early that I'm gonna do everything organic, you know? So I'm hauling compost out to the woods when I started, and I'm hauling organic nutrients. And when I say organic, it's like organic. You know, we're doing the best we can with the knowledge that we have at the time. So over the time, I've progressed to cleaner, more organic, organic, into regenerative principles. So at that time, when you're hauling compost, I was like, oh my God. But it's like, if you, you don't want those pesticides in your medicine, in your cannabis, you don't want that. So that was the main reason why I went organic. I've always gone organic. I've never used synthetic chemicals <coughs> or pesticides ever to my knowledge, my best knowledge base I've ever had. But, so three years ago, I got my new piece of property and 
like Josh, I was in a rush setting it up. So I had like a hundred foot by hundred foot area that I wanted to set up. Had to fell all the trees, but I brought in like hundred yards of local topsoil and compost. It was just me, a backhoe, and a uh, auger. So putting up the fence in was a lot of work. So I couldn't exactly get the soil exactly right just because I was cracked the time. But you know, I was constantly developing, making it better, cover cropping, composting, doing all that stuff. Definitely test your soil. That's definitely key. Like you said, University of Maine does a pretty good job, I think. And uh, four words I really took out of college. Right plant, right place. You want, you need the right plant for the right location. You can't be growing, you know, the wrong plant in the wrong place. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be good. But I encourage everyone. You guys are all here for regenerative agriculture. So you got, I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are all about organics and regenerative principles. But you got to work with what you have and the knowledge base you have at the time. And you just got to do the best you have and what you got. So you're not you're not really preaching to the choir as much as you think because everybody's at different levels and stages and depending on what you're doing and where you're at how much time you've had and what's your abilities and what your funding and stuff and so so much as it's interesting to see the progression because you know you all went bio you know i started off in the bay uh full-blown chem bottom end and, and that was at a time when you could buy jars of avid jars of formite like all the toxic chemicals and the thing was, I got lucky with that because my mom was a chemist and a scientist, and so I knew enough to look it up online to find out that this is for uh, horticulture use, and it's toxic. And so we pulled it out of the system, you know, ever, forever ago. And then because I had all the lab analysis as I got into, you know, commercial cannabis, it let me have the ability to know that I really haven't saturated myself in toxins. And it's just a... Uh, a very comforting thought to know that the majority of people they've really been exposed to way more problems than they thought because most of the products you buy that work really well in the, the, the states where they're doing the regulatory process the the in Oregon they'll come in and test the product on the shelf and I don't mean your pot I mean the product that they use in production and they'll pull it off and say hey everything that was used on this input is now toxic and then they'll go through and on your spray sheets that you have to submit to the state It'll say what you've used in your garden, and if you use these products that are available, that are considered biologically based, they find that they're toxic. They're, they're laying other chemicals inside them. So anything that works really, really well, test it. It's not that expensive. You know, it's like the soil test, the same thing. I took it all the time. I said, you got to do a soil analysis so you can find out what do you need to bring in. And we're lucky where we are, where we have uh, good labs that are available, and we have good mixers. And so they can whip up the, the amendments you're going to need to balance out your, your thing. Regen is fascinating because really you're letting all the materials decompose and create this loop. But the thing is, you have to be able to take time to make that happen. And I think for a lot of individuals, it's a process. And you have to be able to take your time building it. Just like the genetic sifting process where you say right place, right time, right person. Put the right person on that and you've got to complete. Because not everybody can handle or cultivars. Some of them are just tricky. And people who um, don't have that same level of um, OCD, see I didn't even know I had OCD. And I said to my friends one day, I said, you know, I think I got OCD. And they all looked at me like I was, I said, dude, you don't know that? It's, it's, you know, and I was like, no, I never stopped thought about it. And they said, bro, you're obsessive compulsive like we've never seen. And, and I didn't realize it. But it, but it allows you to, to be so about something that you'll put in all this extra work. And, and when you when you go to source plants from people, you have to find out, you know, where was it located so you understand, did it, is it gonna work for you in your circumstance? And you have to also ask, you know, who grew it and gave it to you? Because it's gonna let you understand, is it gonna be complicated? And sometimes it's too complicated and it doesn't allow you to have the success you need because you might not have the time. You might not have the ability. Plants that are more fragile, plants that are more delicate in nature, they require just more work to protect them. And stuff like that, you know, we were talking earlier about having collective groups, you have collective data. And so I'm lucky in the sense that when I release a plant, I can release it through the whole West Coast. And then I can get all the data back on how did it work? How did it work and who to work for and why didn't it work? 
and that starts to let you get these libraries that work for you and your location, and him and his location, but, but not you. And then you know you can pull that right out of the library and your usage so that you make smarter decisions on what you're going. And if you can, if you can be honest about it, it's easy. And a lot of times, you know, you want to challenge yourself, but challenge yourself with micro, micro form, where you put a couple of them out, you see if you can get it to work, but never commit to a large portion of a load that you need to get paid that you haven't run previously. You can't, you can't put yourself in that position of what we're doing because if you make any failures now, the cost of the cost of the loss is too much. Prior, you could afford to make mistakes and you could come back because your margin was great. Margins aren't great anymore. So what you have to be able to do is make educated choices and you know make sure that you're recording this. In the past, we couldn't record anything, and that's one of our problems. When I, I got right into trouble in like 2000, I caught a, a it was funny, but I caught, a, I caught a, a criminal mastermind charge because I had such a complete documentation of all these projects I was working on. And me and my lawyer were cracking up, and he's like, hey, you're a criminal mastermind. And I said, if I was so bright, I wouldn't have been caught. <laughs> but nonetheless, from that point forward, you know, you started going back to just using your memory. But the thing is, you can't really get the accurate assessment of what you're doing without these maps and guides. And so the question right now is, um, what's, what's your desire as you go forward you know, from here? Like, what, what do you see the next couple of years unfolding for you if you had your desire? Otherwise, let's put the fear down and all the crap. If you could go the route you wanted, what would it be? Uh, well, the route we're heading in right now is just to have a bomb for our kids to enjoy and love in life, you know what I mean? We really just like going outside, working the land, and being part of the land. We don't need to make much. We don't need to be anything other than what we like to be. You know, I just breed for fun. And you farm in multiple uh, crops? Over yeah, we have a berry farm as well, honeyberries. So we're going to incorporate the hemp into the honeyberries because we grow hemp as well, too. So if they let us. You know how that's all planned. So. Yeah, I mean, we're just living off the land. We started in a trailer there, pooping in the dirt and bathing in the brook. You know what I mean? Bare bones, so. We enjoy that. We like, we like to play in the mud. We don't need much more. <laughs> so that's kind of where we see it. We want to have a small retail shop. I built a small metal warehouse, 30 by 75. That's as big as I need with a couple of greenhouses. You know what I mean? That's, that's it for us, just to be happy on the land. Yeah, you know, we want to make probably two or three nice products. We're still figuring that out right now, sitting on a bunch of full-spectrum oil. <laughs> but yeah, we enjoy growing the hemp out in the, on the land, too. You know, I'm driving my tractor, smoking a joint, and maybe I got a beer in my hand. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that's all we're trying to do is enjoy the land and create life, basically. That's what we like to do. So, that's our goal. <laughs> Me that I release, I got a bunch of old foundation skunks, and skunk skunk is a is a yeah, skunk's a concept. People people consider it either a varietal, they consider it a scent, they consider it a lime, but, but skunk was a three way hybrid, and in that hybrid there was many many expressions, and I liked that time period. And what you're gonna find is when you get older. You're gonna, you're gonna long for the nostalgia of your youth because it's gonna remind you of those good times. And so, whatever you're smoking right now, if you really like it, trust me, hold on to that shit. Because when you're older, you're gonna wanna go back to the days when you smoked what you liked. And no matter how trendy and cool the weed is of today, your system was dialed in on that. And so for me, I said, hey, I wanna go back and start mining some of these old varieties because I was getting tired of all this trendy shit. And because I have access to all the trendy shit, I just realized it was just, it, it just didn't give me what I wanted, which was quality of experience. So yeah, I was getting high and 
You know, it's giving me a lift or it's doing something, but I just wasn't really enthralled with it. And so I even went into oil heavy. We brought oil into Humble County. So Humble County didn't have any oil sales until I started bringing it into the shop. And I went and sourced it down in SoCal from somewhere where I smoked it. And it was, it was this was the original BHO. And it was so strong that my leg was shaking out of control and I was having like a spasm. And I said, oh, that's real shit. <laughs> and I, I said, we need to bring that home. <laughs> they didn't even have dab rigs. Think about this, they didn't even have dab rigs. And so I had to get a hold of glass blowers to create the, the, the adapters to take your pot bomb and turn it into a dab rig. Didn't even exist, no dab rigs at this time. This stuff is new, there was plenty of custom glass, but it was all for flour. Bob Snodgrass blowing glass forever in Oregon. He was not blowing dab rigs, he was blowing pipes. And we had to get people to come in and create the devices needed so that people could consume it. Because we knew that it was a product that was unbelievably desirable at that time. And I think I must have smoked it for like five years heavy. And I, I got bored. I got bored and I mean, and my tolerance is run real. And it would, we would, me and my buddies would go to these, uh, these, you know, dab events and we would just knock these young dudes out where they were just like, you guys can smoke a lot of drugs. <laughs> and, you know, and, and so, it, you know, it, it got to the point where I just lost the desire. And so then I go back to smoking flour, except I'm bored because it's all this trendy stuff, which just means high levels of terps. And not in a direction that made me feel really happy, just high. And so I realized that maybe I needed to go back to when the last time I felt good smoking pot, and that was you know, some of these old early Californian varieties, except they're not around. And so I went on this global quest to hunt the stuff that was no longer. And, and that's why I always say, you guys, you, you gotta get yourself out there a little bit. You gotta, you gotta team up a little. You gotta be able to network a little bit. Because somebody knows somebody who has what you want. And what you do is you don't abuse that relationship. You just allow it to happen. And over the course of time, you'll acquire it. Like the, Dur the, the, the old Durbins and the old White Durbins. And they're phenomenal. And I just pulled a kill one on the Mount Hood Magic up out of Oregon that was rare and choice, and I was able to sift that one out. But that 88 was a line that uh, they used to do a lot of seed work in Europe, where it's the progenitor for a bunch of seed companies. And I know a guy that, it, that created the modern feminization industry in Europe. So he took the, the technology of cucumber feminization and applied it to cannabis, and he was the first one to do it. So he's basically a jobber. So he produces the seeds for the companies that wholesale it. So he produces all the seeds for all these major brands. And then they take it and repackage it. And based off of your branding, dictates the price of the seed. So same exact seed from a company that you didn't even, you didn't even make the seed. But he makes the seed, sells it to you. If you have, if you have a great brand, you can wrap it in your package and sell it for three times the price of someone else, but it's the same exact stock. So I hook up with these guys in Europe and uh, they come over to visit me and, and we start playing around because they needed stuff that I had access to. And I said, listen, what I want to do is I want to get some hands on this other stuff. And so they were able to deliver me this old 88. And it's just a really nice plant. And it, it has the, the, the old fun smoke of the past. And then I pulled in a killer 81. And there's this guy named Watson and he's Sam the Skunk Man. He's got this kind of notorious past. but. I bring him up because he's the one that put the first data point of skunk on the Philo's galaxy. And I put an 81 on the galaxy and it's the same plant. And so the genetic mappers asked me, did you get that from Dave? And I said, no, I got it from the guy that Dave must have got it from. And so we, which is, which is unbelievable coincidence. So I was able to source a plant that was a foundation of the European movement of skunk from someone up in the hills in Humboldt, out of Salmon Creek, and I had no idea. It's just that this it was it was Lawrence. So Lawrence Ringo, who was this famous CBD breeder, when when he and I were friends, and when he passed away, I got the majority of his collection to pass out to the public because they knew I was going to open source all this material. And then his librarians had some varietals that they had held private, and they were having a hard time keeping them because the plants were breaking down due to lack of attention. And so they said, listen, if you could keep this alive and restore it and get it up, you're welcome to have it. And so I threw it into an earth box setup and then got it into the greenhouse. We could just let it stabilize and it did the same thing. It, it, it cracked the cambium, it threw all the meristematic material, we took the clones, restored it, 
and it's gorgeous. But they're not the, they're not the skunk piss. They're way more floral. That was a that was a fruit with some burnt tire on it. You know what I mean? You got some yeah, burnt tire like someone's peeling out your front yard. And I love that stuff too. I like the, I like the skunk urine smells. But the truth of it is, is that the, they're more debilitating, so they're really heavy. And when I was and I don't mind that, but what I wanted was pot that when you smoked it, you were happy, and you were just about what you were doing. And I realized that that really is a massive demographic. Because I'm older now, I, I hang out with people that are older. And I said, holy shit, all of us 50 to 70 want cannabis that, that has this effect. Because most of the cannabis today is almost a little too powerful for people my age. Exactly. Don't, don't say, be gentle, be gentle. Don't be gentle. We don't like to say that. Cured. I'm cured. I'm not old. I'm cured. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and so I, I, I sorted out some of these killers, and then I went to go do this reclamation project. They grabbed some killer stuff out of San Diego, the original hog. So the hog that you got, I got the hog's breath that makes the hog. So I get the hog's breath, and I got it right out of the old school San Diego group, and I had these other skunks, and then I was gonna do a project with them, and I ended up getting really ill about a year ago and almost died, and I didn't expect it to kick the shit out of me so bad, but it just did, man. I came out of the hospital, and I was like, man, I'm not really about doing much except just trying to function. And so I paused on the project, and what happened was the project had caught attention. And the next thing I know, I'm getting people from all over the earth hitting me up who's holding stock forever, and people who want to be involved in the project, and people who also have old skunk material, and it was their children that were like 40, that had you know a mid seventy year old dad, and they saw me online, and they said, "Hey, my old man." I showed my old man the video, and he said, "That's the guy I want to give my, my my material to because he reminds me of me." You know, same background kind of stuff. And so I ended up acquiring this unbelievable collection of old material from the mid seventies all the way into like ninety. It's all skunk lines from all over the world. And the number of people that sent me Polaroids. Remember Polaroids? Yeah. Hey, people don't even know what those are nowadays. Polaroid pictures of the crop, crop notes. And I, I just put them all away. And I'm just holding them until we can figure out the formulations in the lab a little better so I can start in vitro popping all these. And then we'll start being able to pull out all these stunning varietals from the past that had really been sifted and sorted for quality of experience because the labs had not a damn thing to do with that reality. And you need to go back to that in terms of ethereal cannabis, where you're not looking at anything that quantifies quality but the experience. And so, um, so I, I, I was kind of cautious who I pass it out to. Me and Chad would connect online. But you know, a lot of people are aggressive and they have uh, poor behavioral patterns. It means they don't know how to behave, and they don't they don't they didn't learn how to say please or thank you, and they 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 come at you hard. And for me, man, I I clown you there. I just clown you because I just don't think that that's a cannabis relationship. You know, it, it had to be basically um, caring. And so I only passed it out to a couple people because like I said, you always gotta share the material. You can't hoard it, something will happen, you'll lose it, you'll never get it again, and you'll, you'll regret it. The Royal Kush is a good example. The Royal Kush from Mandel, I hold Mandel's mother. So me and Mandel are buddies. Mandel gets in trouble and has to bounce out of the country. He comes back, all his stock was gone, he had no more genetics. He's like, bro, this is horrible. And I said to him, I said, man, I said, I got all your mothers. I'm holding all your moms, I'm holding the truth, I'm holding the turpentine, I'm holding the royal, I'm holding all your foundation stock. And he was like, holy shit. And it, it was from that that all these current royal lines come from. And then the next thing you know is I lose the plant and I'm like, oh my God. And a buddy of mine calls me and says, Kev, I'm having so much fun with that plant you gave me a couple of years back. And I said, what plant's that? He goes, you know, that killer purple royal. And I went, oh my God. And I was able to get it back. You cut it back. And so the point of it is, is and the same thing I was saying earlier, is these are people that just love cannabis that you share it with. You share it with cats that are gonna go do business and all that other crap. I've had people that I've given varieties to and then asked them for a copy and they try to charge me for the damn thing, literally. And I'm like, dude, I gave it to you. And they're like, I know, but it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> I said, I know it's worth a lot of money. I'm going to gave you the fucking thing. And you can't get it back. And so what you do is you, you, you connect with people that you think are good people. And what you do is you put them into the material. 
and you let them play with it. I let I let Jason from Equilibrium Genetics get a hands on it because he, he's a, a really ethical dude, really, really about cannabis culture, and he's a good breeder. And so he's got his hand on a piece of it, you got your hand on a piece of it, I got a copy of it. And it's just really nice plant, man. Pathogenically resistant, ferocious, killer smell, great growth characteristics. All things you need, and I can see why these companies in Europe, or, or this one guy who, who creates all this stock in Europe, uses it as his progenitor. But um, yeah, that's the story of the 88 skunk. And the 81 is what we're going to go into next. So the 81 is so pungent that just as a vegetative mother, if you, if you dry rub the stem or you cut some clones, it'll fill an entire building with those volatile esters. It's got such an alcohol release, it's unbelievable. And all of these plants I was going to get into and work on and breathe, then I got sick and I was just like, man, I just don't got the energy. And I chilled, and then everybody started sending me more stock. So now I got to go mine through all the new stock to go put with the old stock. But the point is, at some point in time, we're going to have this beautiful skunk library of all these things that had been sorted out and chosen that were really popular, that for a lot of people at my age, that's what we got introduced to is really primo cannabis. We went from the commercial cannabis from exterior sources, which was good if it was good. A lot of people smoke brick, but if you're getting bales of it, every now and then there's bales exceptional. And from that exceptional bale, you realize, wow, Colombian is no joke. And you start to get into the Afghanis and the Thais and all this stuff that was moving through the neighborhood because my neighborhood was underworld. And so the quantity of cannabis moving through was disproportionate. And because my family was uh, involved in crime, it allowed me to be able to be around all these people without anybody really worrying about me. So it ends up giving you access into stuff. And so I got to experience all these incredible things, but I wanted to go back in time. And the skunk is, is, is the skunk is it, boy, it's nasty. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah, I can remember smoking some old skunk from a uh, farmer next door where I grew up. The, uh, his grandson I used to hang out with a lot. And every year he had the same exact skunk and it just had a couple of beans in it every time we opened it up. And I swear he just left the mail out there just long enough to pollinate them every year. And it's still to the day the best smoke I've ever had was that skunk. I wish I could get it nowadays, but you know. Laying into it. What, what are you putting into that? Uh, you're doing a whole bunch of work, right? Yeah, I am. Uh, so, so then, uh, five years ago, I got over Kev and I, I sent him an email uh, and, and kind of laid it out who I was uh, in a nutshell and, and and asked if he could help me out with some with some beans maybe that I was repopulating my library and uh, <laughs> I got a, he sent me four crosses and the Louis the Thirteenth is just amazing. I found some really nice stuff in that, and uh, Kim Dog Special Reserve uh, from Aficionado, who is definitely one of my favorite breeders. Um, the Creme Brulee, which we got from you last year, is is off the hook, uh, fungally, definitely uh, fungally resistant in Maine. Um, I did have the Hollyweed right next to the Creme and had some trouble there, uh, and fungal. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure that we've got a different pathogen thing you've got on the west coast there's two identified over there and it looks like medicinal genomics has just identified a new uh, uh pm over here and it's uh, no problems for you guys i was like what's this Jeff sent me something that does have problems and then <laughs> all on purpose right yeah and, and then uh, lo and behold it comes out uh four months ago that there is that, that they've identified a new uh a new fungal pathogen so the fungal pathogens that you're dealing with here in Maine are most likely not the same ones, uh, or it's a possibility that this, that uh, that it's not the same one on the West Coast. You want to be careful what you get. Uh, anyway, he sent me the seeds uh, were kind of how we started, and and I kind of wondered where you went for a couple of years there. I was I was asking me you were sick. That makes sense. And uh, I had a friend go out uh, the West Coast not long ago, and I was like, you've got to go see Kev for me. And he's like, I don't think we're gonna do it. And I'm like. You've got to do it. We're never going to be friends again if you don't. And, <laughs> and uh, so I got the and uh, I got the Royal Coast Seven and the Creme and the Hollyweed. Um, but the 88 is where it's at for me. Uh, I cut clones off of that three days ago, and remarkable. Uh, when you cut clones, a lot of times you'll you'll get the turps. You know, you'll get the the smell on your hand quite a bit, and uh, I'll, I'll, I still can smell it. When I, and it took me back in time. 
so I'm super excited. I'm gonna run, uh, I'm gonna hit it with a lot of stuff. So I've got, uh, I've got an Afghan mail, it's my prize mail, kind of like your Afghan five maybe. I'm gonna get that into it. Um, I'm looking to, I've got some uh, Moroccan uh, stuff and uh, Nanda Devi. I've got some stuff right from uh, the uh, base of uh, the second tallest mountain there in India, uh, and, and it looks like it's gonna be a real nice thin leaf uh, cross, you know, it's, uh, who knows what's gonna happen there. But uh, my, my idea with the ADA is to throw uh, uh, my more heterozygous males into it to try to uh, do what you're doing, and that's pull out what might still be out there. And uh, rather than trying to stabilize it and keep it here, uh, a little bit harder to grow than, than some of the other stuff that I have. I mean, uh, uh, I, I had uh, I, I had some trouble early on with, uh, actually one of those plants came out with crescent mites. And uh, I couldn't understand, I never dealt with it before. Um, I've dealt with mites, I've dealt with thrips, I've dealt with a lot of shit. But uh, the russets I hadn't, and uh, I started seeing uh, the, the branches fall off the kush. Didn't know why, and that's uh, it was you know down in the yeah yeah it was yeah. So needless to say, we're trying to clean up the others maybe, and the 88's healthy, and uh, so it's it's here, and I'll hold on to that for sure. Uh, I'm looking forward to see what we get. What are you working on now? I'm working on a lot of stuff. <laughs> So I'm an outdoor grower, light depth. That's all I've done for the past three years. In the past, I've done indoor perpetual gardens for years. So my main focus is fungal resistance, early finish time. Those are the main two factors that I'm trying to work with. And uh, just a couple of strains that I'm working with is uh, an Arcata train wreck, and I love the train wreck. It's one of my favorite strains. I had the cut that was going around Portland like 10 years ago like white paint kind of smell, and would never finish outside at all, you know, let it go. With one finish, you'd get the smaller bugs, but I crossed it with a Lambo OG, and that brought down the flower time by like two weeks. So I put that one out this year, and beautiful stuff, cheesy, no more smell, but get this train wreck effect, the way earlier finish time. So I'm working on that strain specifically, which uh, I'm gonna call Wreck of Lamb, because train wreck off across the lamb line, right there, you're playing right there. But, uh, but another thing is always give your strains out to people, give your seeds out to your friends, give your cuts out to people, because that strain, I lost all the seeds to that. So it's like, all right, I got no seeds, but I gave my buddy 50 seeds. So I go to his house and he's like, oh, here's your seeds. So always give them out to people that you know, people that you don't know, get them out there, because you can definitely get them back if you lose them to the right people. So I'm working on the train wreck Lambo. I got some other Lambo crosses. The Lambo really brings down the flowering time I've seen. Like when I throw that Lambo pollen on anything, it'll seem to cut the flowering time by two weeks. Like I crossed an amnesia haze with the Lambo too. I call that one forgetful fruit, which is Lambo super fruity. And uh, it cut the flowering time by three weeks, I think, on the amnesia haze. So that one was done really early. And then I'm working with the Friesland, and that one was done on August 22nd, as I said before. So I'm crossing that with some different Royal hybrids. So I'm gonna be testing those out this year to see how those go as far as finish time, mold resistance, and all that stuff. And yeah, I'm moving forward and just working with mold resistance stuff and different things like that. Do a good little run through. So this is what we where we come from, where we get our inspiration from, where we worked with when we started, what's our desires, where are we going. Now we got a chance to talk to you guys. So we'll chop it up. Well, you got you like you got, you got hand muscles. Give us a tired shoulder. Oh, right. Right. Oh, right. Just wait, just wait. You can wait. Right. Right. Oh, and, right. and, and just direct who you wanted to go yeah. to because so all, yeah. all three of you guys. I'm up like a little south of Moosehead, so I'm way up there. It's inspiring to hear about outdoor growers having success, just longevity. I really like greenhouses. I don't own one. I've worked with one. I think they're amazing, but I would like to hear everyone's pros and cons on greenhouses. Are they worth the money? Uh, are they not worth the money? Do they help with the mold? Do they not help with the mold? And definitely don't own. Greenhouses don't house. help with mold. Unless you have a lot of dehumidification and a lot of air. Flow. But not getting rained on? Like, I would think not getting rained on would help. If you have the right strain that 
Here we go. We the greenhouse. <coughs> the greenhouse is a basically just like a big tarp over your plant, trapping in moisture and heat. If you can't get rid of the heat and the moisture appropriately, then you're just working backwards. So it takes a lot of energy to run a greenhouse appropriately in Maine. Um, you can try and do roll up sides, but you're still going to get that air trapped above your buds. So I like to just breed plants that grow well outside and you know adapt to mother nature and do well in the ground and honestly I'm having best luck just aerating the soil a little bit and planting right in there I don't put much in the soil there's so many minerals out there that doesn't need much input we, we just we just put in a, a I would call it state of the art because it's pretty state of the art um, their greenhouses work good for cyclical production Right, so I like I like my farm. My personal farm is straight outdoor, right? and so that's that's what I prefer. I want to see single season, single cycle. I want to be able to plant them and watch them go through, and I want the farm to sit fallow for the winter. So this way, what it does is it it gives you a break. The thing is that you know when you're in business, a lot of times you know you need to make sure that there's cash flow, and so greenhouses work really well for that. But you have to be able to spend the money. You need you need stuff that has automatic ridge vents. You have to have the ability to dry the air. You need hydronics, so you're going to need to have be able to heat and cool your bottoms, so that during the cold part of the year you can keep the root zone at 68, 72. During the warm part of the season you can keep it at 68, 72. You're going to have to run supplemental lights. All this one, these are all, these are all fluids lit, so these are all LED lit. And so you know, but the cost is unreal. And then you know the engineering is tough, so you guys are going to have to go heavy snow load. We have to go heavy wind shear. And so you end up having to upgrade the, the overall structure of it. But the bottom line is, if you're able to get a market piece, where you're able to get into the market, sometimes a small greenhouse, don't go overboard with it, but a small greenhouse allows you to be able to keep running crops and it lets you still touch the market intermittently. And what it does, it lets you do all your testing too because you, you're able to constantly run new varieties. So you got at least five cycles you can run a year. It lets you start to take the cuts that you have and you find out how do they do with cold feet, which is, which is your early cycles. So some plants don't like cold feet. Some plants do not like heat spikes and humidity spikes, which is what you get when you're deafened. Some plants don't like it when it's cold at the end because you end up having rot problems. So first part of the season it is one type of plant that, that is, you'll be wary of. Middle season is, is a different type of plant you have to be wary of, and at the end of the season, a different type of plant. And so what it does, it starts to give you R&D on the plants that you have, and you're able to do it. And you're able to start kind of copying your biological delivery outside, so you can find out, is it working for me here? Am I getting the numbers I'm supposed to get? Am I going to get a canopy on it? When I initiate, what, what, is, my, what is my stretch? How big is this plant really going to be? What am I going to have to deal with in that? So greenhouses are a killer tool for what you use. But they're not this panacea that everybody paints them to be. Everyone says, if I got this, I'm going to do great. And I'm like, no, you got a mold factory if you screw this up. And you've got an ungodly heat load in these things in the summertime if you're getting some really hot days. And the problem is that if those heat days come in when you're going to finish the cycle, you're flaring off all your monos and you end up having herb that's dry with no smell. And so you have to make sure that you have you know, adequate ventilation. People are using these greenhouses that are designed for plant growth, vegetative, with wet walls and crap like that. But that's not what you're looking for. That's a pathogen factory. And so a lot of the greenhouses, you know, if you've got the ability to put a small one in, you've got the ability to run some small depth, you've got the ability to use them to be able to do testing, you've got the ability to hold your stock, breeding. I'm more talking cold frame, like as an accent to my house. I would be adding lights, no supplemental lights. Yeah, cold frame is nice to start a season, just yank the cover off. So you yank the cover off. So do the cold frame, and that's going to get you, it's going to get your greenhouse effect, so you trap in the UV. And then peel that material off through the cycle, and you can put it on at the end of the year if you're going to get some. Right, some, that October that gets ugly, as we all know. Yeah, and, and I prefer. I'm thinking it's a good investment. It is. Well, it, it is. It, it is, it's just that it holds a different level of humidity within the hut and you don't get any airflow and it's the airflow that works to dry the plant. So I would rather have a plant rained on and then wind dry than have it just humid. They're different, you know what I mean? So that's how I see that one first. I remember Frost. 
a lot of people don't realize frost it comes straight it. down Recording. straight it's down you look underneath <laughs> your house underneath the overhangs frost won't be there for the for the first foot or something so if you cover the top of that greenhouse you leave those sides wide open that's a good thing back in the day when we were gorilla go around uh, uh, i tell guys to look for maples and oaks trees and get up under the south side of one of those you're guaranteed good soil from the leaves all those year maybe a little bit high in mag or or phosphorus but uh but you've got that canopy of uh the maples about the same heat signature at the same time of the year i mean there's some advantages but uh um uh, the top of that trees you know uh, uh keeping you from getting hit with frost uh, of course the colder temperatures can be can be really bad without hydraulics without having to boil up just one thing just uh, one thing about light depth, you can do outdoor light deprivation too, where you just build a hoop house without any covering, and the only covering that you're going to be using is the tarp that you're pulling. So I'll do a morning light depth, so it's only going to be covered for like two, three hours, something like that, just to cut out the sun for that certain amount of time, so the heat's not going to build in there as much. So you're only covering for a really short amount of time. And again, the outdoor benefits of all that. <coughs> so that's another thing. And you can set those up really cheap. I think the one that I did was 70 feet long and like four feet wide, just one bed. And that was like probably $200, something like that, pretty cheap. So, and also uh, the light depth tarps for Forever Fly and Greenhouse, they have like actually breathable light depth tarps. So check them out. They're a little expensive, but in the long run, it pays off. When you're gonna for, for deck two, if you're if you're really trying to make it work for you, you have to be able to figure out when do you get the majority of your light. So are you a morning light? Or are you evening light? Which one? I'm, so if, if you're in a valley and you're catching it full time, you can make the choice. But you want to catch the preponderance of light, and you you let that dictate your actual tarp cycle. It'll show his picture. And what you're gonna find though is that when you cover that thing up, you're gonna see a heat increase. It's gonna blow your mind. So if you get inside a deck and have someone tarp you while you're in it, and sit there on the floor with the flashlight and the gauge, you're gonna see that temperature and humidity explode. And you're gonna be like, I got you. That's why certain plants don't do well in it. And so you have to kind of log that information so you choose the right stock. But you don't need to have a cover over it. The plastic is nice for the early part of the season because it heats it up and it gets these things moving. And with biologically based systems, if that shit's under 60 degrees, you're not having anything happen. There's no activity when it's under 60. So you gotta warm it up a little bit to get it moving. And then what it does, it lets you work with it. And then, and then, I mean, people typically use panda film and stuff, but it doesn't work for me because my wind load's too high up in my farm, and so I use I use custom tarps. But they're expensive, you know. I, I mean, for the four for the four depth beds that I used to run, that you know, each tarp was two grand. But it's a tarp that can handle being in you know 80 mile an hour wind once you secure it. It does not get ripped. There's no penetrations. You can pull it yourself. There's no issues, and you got to invest in it. But to me, I didn't think that depth helps you helps you hit cyclical needs, and I like a small depth so I can test stock, and I like I like to be able to use them to grow weird stuff that I know I can't grow on my farm. So there's things that I really really want to smoke, but I can't, and I know the market doesn't want it, so I'm not going to be able to buy it. And so it lets me mess around with some weird Asian stock that needs you know 120 days of time to go. So I can, I can put it in as a tiny, tiny plant and just pull down and allow this thing to finish and give me what I want. I mean, I used to black box with, with, with um, refrigerator boxes. And so I would have a single plant in the backyard on the, on the deck that I would want to depth out. And I would just use a refrigerator box and put it over the top of it. And, yeah, it works great. You don't have to be complicated. But if you're trying to be in business with greenhouses, you definitely have to look at them as an investment and you have to use all the tools because if you put this giant <coughs> structure up, you're gonna get the greatest vegetative growth you've ever seen in your life because vegetative growth loves humidity. Plants love to be moist when they're growing. But as soon as that thing goes into flower and you start to get into that mid to latter flower and you start to create mold issues, you're gonna be chasing that stuff with the bucket tied to your waist and you're gonna be out there every day culling mold. And by the time you're done, you just, you, you wore out. So if you're going to get into greenhouses, man, you don't get a cheap one. Cheap one means small. In California, we can do cheap stuff because we're dry. So we have different climates. You guys definitely have a tougher climate than us. 
And so you have to be able to figure out, is it worth your time to put the infrastructure in? Do you have the market to push that product? And if you don't, don't trip. You have better luck just going full term and, and you know, selection. Have you ever worked with Wallapini or subterranean greenhouses? You know, I haven't. I researched them because I was so interested in the fact that you could hold the subterranean, but the problem in Humboldt is we get so much friggin' water that comes down that it, it's, you know, I mean, we get 12 inches in a single shot. And so it's a tough one when we're in real rain season because really created a flooded spot. It's almost like, what's the point of having the greenhouse if I can't use it in the winter? Because that's the whole point of the Wallapinis is that you're able to hold temperature and keep it up. So for us, anything that's in the ground is really tough because of the rain cycle. But for you here, it'd be kind of cool. The problem with them is the angle of inclination sends the light at, a, at an angle through the wallopini that most people don't have it lifted correctly. What you end up having is half of it shaded inside. Mm -hmm. So you end up having very little light. You end up having to wrap these things with material that gets you higher light reflectivity. But it's the same thing. Is it is it needed to go in the ground like that? What are you really benefiting from? They're kind of cool, but is it something that's going to work for you on a commercial level? So you could create a small one so that you could use it and enjoy it. It makes you feel good about what you're doing. But if you go flat ground, man, plant that shit. Straight up. The, the easier, the better. The easier it is to harvest it, the less trouble, the less build out, the less worry about you guys with snow. All of a sudden, you're going to get 14 inches of snow. It'll collapse. It all over Oregon. Oregon has the snow in years. Go take a look online at how many of these giant greenhouse structures have collapsed. And it, it, I mean, I'm talking in twisted tubes of metal. We get rainfall so heavy that when you grow plants that are like, you know, eight to 10 pounds, which I can't do on my hill, my wind load's too high. And, but the reason why I love the hill is because I have such a high wind load with such incredible southern exposure at an altitude that gets no mold that I get the greasiest, hardest, nastiest flower. So I know that even though I have less, I can get more and I can move it quicker. But my buddies that have a little more lower altitude, a little more temperate climate, a lot less wind, they can do these giant plants well, all of a sudden, you know, you get a storm coming that's going to dump four or five inches in an hour, and you're going to get 80 mile an hour winds blowing through it, ragdolls your stuff. And so you kind of have to be honest about what's the real conditions of where you're at, and then say, listen, I don't want anything neat, I don't want anything trendy, I just need shit that works. And when it comes to spending money, you can put enough money on anything and make it work, but how do you recover the funds? You know, and so that's my thing with technology is that. I got a, we got labs with all kinds of killer stuff, but it's because it works for what I'm doing. But if it doesn't, I just tell people, don't do it. If you want to re re reclaim a plant pretty easily, use an earth box and stick it outside. You don't got to spend 10 grand to scrub it to get it to a workable level. Scrubbing a plant through TC removes the problem. Biological methodologies reduces it to a point that it's not an issue, but it's still there. So really, what, what can you afford and in what, what direction do you want to go? Mm -hmm. Who else got a question? Way in the back. Can you guys talk a little bit about uh, so I've gone through this and seen that this is my flower. If I buy seeds from a reputable seed company and now I have 30 big ones and at the end of the harvest, okay, well, three of these plants did great and out of a big yield, I've got 20 or 30 seeds and there's 10. The first seeds I ever, the first thing I ever did when I bought seeds was immediately cross them back to themselves. It wasn't for sale, it was just for seed preservation, so I always had more seeds. I didn't even pick out the males or females, I just pollinated them, open pollination. That's what I used to do. Now that I have so much to work with, I've gotten a lot more selective. So but, um, that means you just crack them all, let them have at it, and then just save those seeds that come from not grown? Yeah, I mean, you can be a little more selective with that, do you know what I mean? You can choose your male and female, but the main point is if you buy a pack of seeds from someone, those are your seeds. Make more of them so you can grow more plants. I mean, you spent the money on them. And Just they duplicate them. You that first run. Like, you yeah. Let them go. I mean, because people wouldn't let, like, they wouldn't go for that. You have to back off them or something. Kind of, kind of. What happened? In a perfect world, when people, there really, there really is no technical F1s in cannabis because there are no stable lines to work with, right? But we're just going to use those, those, these, these classifications so it's easy to say. So you buy a pack of seeds, 
It's two dissimilar varietals put together. And that gives you this F1 that you buy. And in the old days, it would be two dissimilar populations that were um, very stable. And when you cross them, you end up getting this incredible uniformity. So that's not the case anymore, right? Because we're working with these squirrel populations. So you take that first population. What he's saying is he takes the seeds and he just pollinates them so he has stock. That's your F2. It's in the F2 that you're going to start to see concentrations of stuff you want and stuff you don't want. And you just call out the shit you don't want if you're working for production. If we're talking about seed preservation, I want to hold the line for time. I want all the material present. If I'm trying to create a line that's stable to use for production, I want to call out all the weird stuff, stuff that just does not match what I'm seeking. Now you can start to collect males and females and start to work that in the direction you choose. And if you can run two concurrent lines at the same time, then you can have subtle differences within this genomic, this genomic profile that lets you bounce them against each other so that you can increase your vigor as you go forward. The more you inbreed something, the less you reduce the vigor. But if you can go against the line that you ran at the same time, so out of 100 seeds, we pulled out, pulled out two packs of 10. So we have five males, five females, five males, five females, line A, line B. I start to work those generations each time selecting and choosing more towards the direction I like. As you go forward without using any technology, you'll be able to start to see patterns of, of repetition. And you'll start to say, listen, everything that had that swirl leaf, that crooked petiole, that seemed to be connected to the quality plants. And then you mark them. And you mark all these outliers. And then you can test them. And then you're able to run them. And what you end up having is two populations that are very similar, but they're different enough that when you go against them, you can reboot that quality. Mostly with seed, it's a lot of work for time. So you have to have a down the road vision of what you're doing, unless you're able to get a hold of breeders that are working some stuff that you specifically want. Back crossing is where you're throwing it back to the parent, either male or female, to see if you can intensify a trait or diminish traits that you don't like. And the only way you're going to find out if the male or the female is going to pass that on is to do it. And so the problem is that you back cross it and then you believe that your next run is going to be better. And it might not be because the traits that you're seeking aren't held in that parent. So therefore, you're never going to get it out of that parent. And that's where you know, um, marking, marker-assisted breeding projects, scientific breeding is so helpful because they're able to go inside, take a look and say, hey, the allele's not present for that. It's just not here. And so what you're trying to do is go with seed form, but is there a reason why you're going with seed form for your production versus clone? Well, if I have, you know, I said I buy two seven ones and two from Humboldt Seed Company, and mm -hmm. I get five, I got a case of venom. Those are expensive. Now I've got, you know, three or forty seeds of venom seeds, but you know, you can't put them in the garden next year because they're not from Humboldt or they have they have not much seed health, or they have the exact health, and that's what you know everybody around me will say. There's no way that anybody's even knows who is even. Yeah, you're fine with what you're yeah, doing. You pull out, you know, you pull out your seed out of your bud or whatever, and now you have your little cellophane full of seeds, but nobody's going to use it. Like no, no, you can use them. You can use them all the time, and even self, and you're going to find that random pollination works. You're going to find that there's genetic anomalies in everything you do because you're going to see in just look for Hermes, basically. yeah instabilities, and in, in order to look for Hermes, you got to stress it yourself. You got to heat it up. You got to cool it down. You got to push a lot of end through it. You got to screw up the life cycle. Just like when you're trying to test for um, you know, mold resistance, spray it down with water from the hose. The ones that rot don't use. But as a farmer trying to survive in the current, it's easiest to take the populations you're working and work them and just accept the fact that for the short time that's in front of you, the market does not want that differentiation. What they want is you want to take the venom OG cut that really killed it in your garden, the one that shined, and you hold it. And that becomes your production plan. <laughs> And then from there, you can start throwing pollen at it and start to work the direction from it. But the thing is, you got to remember that every time you're working with seed, if you're, if you're in a population of seed that's patentable, it's only like, you know, 25% are common. So the idea that cannabis with as many traits as it holds is going to come out that consistent is a reach. And until we work these lines for a, a, a good market, a good commoditized product like, you know, wheat, corn, it's 10 years and a million progeny. That's how you get the stability there. None of us in the industry have that ability. So what I tell people about breeding is 
replicate stuff that you want to hold for time because you're into it. It works good for you, you work with it. If you're, if you're taking stock that you're making off your, off your plants, where you're choosing the males that you're using to lay pollen onto the females, you hold that, you can do small test plots, you don't have to run them full size, you don't got to commit to massive, you can even shoot them indoor just to see, is my quality of smoke consistent? Is my morphological traits consistent? Soak them down. Is my mold resistant consistent? And it'll help you understand where you're steering the populations. And the part that's tough is you've got to keep copies of the progenitors. You've got to be able to label these things and say, okay, males A through E, females A through E, and then you hold them for a couple of years while you're doing this because you're not really sure which one's bringing the traits you want. So a lot of times I tell people, look, you breed for preservation, you breed because it makes you intimately connected with what you're doing, but I'm putting clones on the field because the market wants that specific cut. And that's not a purist view, and there's a certification through Bronner, David Bronner's doing a cert, and clones get the least amount of love, but I'm like, David, you're not selling weed, you're selling soap, and if I took your soap and I changed the formulation every time I bought it, I wouldn't be buying Bronner's soap. So how can you, have differentiation in something that people want very specific, which is tough. And so like I said, what you do is you don't work these things because it always makes you more intimately knowledgeable about what's inside the plant you're working with. You start to see what's really in there, you can see the directions, and you're gonna find outliers, but hold the progenitors and make sure you hold the production cut you wanna use that's allowing you to sell that pot at the store. And then from there, now you can go forward with the adventure of breeding. Because the adventure of breeding in the past was people bought your weed because that's what you had. Now they're going to want something specific from you, and when it deviates too much from that, you lose the target. Um, do, do you do you just grow everything from seed? recommend uh, the same thing that uh, Kev's recommended and the only thing I wouldn't recommend is to uh, to just kind of try to open pollinate every year you know um, one thing's for sure you start throwing pollen on a female and depending on how much you're putting on those pistols uh, you might get a little bit different flower production out of it I mean you're still getting a good idea but um, yeah I don't, I don't know if I'd be back crossing every time or isolated trait. Yeah, or isolated trait. Isolated trait. You try to isolate a trait so you can go forward, but that's the same thing. That's a multi-year pro a project. And so think of that as like your R and D. And if you're if you're paid to do R and D, that's phenomenal. That's your, that's your division. But you're a producer who does R and D. So just realize that your production funds the R and D. And if you just treat it like that, it's a lot easier, a lot more accurate. Okay, yeah, I just. I'm gonna jump to last coffee, so anybody who wants any, <laughs> I'll get you my Didn't want to deprive anybody. No, 